Um, but I just had a couple of questions about this. This was your first role in a motion picture. So can you talk about how this all came about? Uh, it, it was uh, bashert, as we say. It was meant to be. Um, I was working with my parents in the Yiddish theater. And uh, I heard that uh, Menachem Golan, who was one of our great producers, was about was competing with uh, another producer, Mordechai Navon of Geva Films, to do Kunilamo. There was a competition going on. And uh, in the end, Mr. Navon, may he rest in peace, the producer of this uh, film, who undertook an amazing undertaking to, uh, um, to produce something like this, especially that last scene. We did that on the last day, the wedding scene, with hundreds of extras. A, a little shtetl, that entire town that you see, was built in give a time on a huge lot. And tour, ki, uh, on the weekends, tourists used to come and bring their kids to see this little you know, shtetl from Europe that was constructed. Uh, and I heard that they were going to do the movie. And of course, I had known the legendary musical Kuni Lemel. Every great Yiddish star had performed that role. Uh, and we were doing a Yiddish musical called The Megillah. And one night, the director, Becker, from Habima, and the producer came to see our show, the Yiddish show. And uh, after the first act, uh, they came backstage. And my father said, wait, you'll see him in the second act. And Mr. Navon said, I already want to see him in Kuni Lemel. And at that point, I knew that the role was mine. Um, I can still remember how much I got for it. <laughs> 5,000 lirot. It wasn't shekel at the time. Adam, kama ta kibalta? Ta zocher? Ata shilamta lazot. I think we even, we would have paid to make this movie. And, uh, you know, up until then I was a kid in the Yiddish theater. The moment the movie came out, it came out exactly uh, almost 50 years ago in July on my birthday. And overnight, overnight, uh, it's like what happened to Dustin Hoffman after The Graduate. He was a pretty good actor up until then, but the next day everybody knew. And uh, since then I've been blessed. And it's, uh, everybody says, aren't you tired of being called a Kuni Lemel? Uh, to me, it, it's, you know, the most humbling thing that second and third generation already uh, remember this film. And we did two sequels. We did Kuni Lemel in Tel Aviv and Kuni Lemel in Cairo. And I think someday we should do Kuni Lemel in the Knesset. <laughs> but there are so many Kuni Lemels there already. I don't think they need another one. <laughs> Talk about um, what it was like playing these two roles. Uh, you know, I didn't even have to think about it because as a, as a kid in the Yiddish theater, I used to play roles like Kuni Lemel, the little, you know, a, a Hasid, the funny little guy. I, I played that character. But the reason uh, that they chose me at the time was because they needed someone to play the leading man as well, Max. Uh, and there actually had been an actor in Israel whose name is Yaakov Bodo. Some of you may remember. He played Kuni Lemel on stage, but he only played the Kuni Lemel. Obviously, he couldn't play both parts. And he, he, wouldn't, he, d he didn't look like he could play the Leading, the, the leading man as well. So they needed somebody to play both roles. But you know, to tell you the truth, it's been 50 years and I just didn't have to think about it. It just came naturally. It was something that I guess must have been in my uh, you know, background or my uh, DNA. Uh, it came naturally to me. No. <laughs> No, I have many, many, many questions. I mean, what's the difference between playing Cooney Level and P.T. Barnum? Uh -huh. That must have been a very exciting time for you on Broadway. The difference was about 30 years. <laughs> uh, I was very lucky uh, to uh, have been um, 
cast to re uh, replace Jim Dale, who was a great star, and he won the Tony Award for Barnum. Uh, and uh, it was uh, a challenge because I had to be a, uh, I had to go to circus school and learn how to walk a wire, to jump on a trampoline, to juggle, and uh, uh, they thought I was crazy, but I was the first, I, I flew in from Israel on my own dime to audition, and my agent said, they're not gonna hire you, they're looking for a star, and I said, if I don't try, I will regret it for the rest of my life. I flew in from Israel, I did the audition, I came back, and I won out over almost 100 candidates, uh, including, I remember the most famous one was the $6 million man. What was his name? Uh, Lee Majors. Everybody wanted that role. Uh, but I had to go through um, circus school, and I can still walk a wire. It's like, yeah, I had to do that as well. Um, it to totally different, and um, uh, I don't know. Uh, I have been uh, blessed and fortunate because I was born to two great, great talents, my mother and my father, and uh, I think I, I inherited it from them. Well, I, had, okay. I had a question about your parents, and I wanted to know what you learned from your parents about performance and how it influenced your career. The question was, what did he learn from his parents, and how did it influence his career? Uh, I learned from watching my parents. Uh, they were both such uh, charming and talented people, especially my father. Uh, you saw him on the screen. My father played the teamster that brings Kuni Lemel, Shiele, that brings Kuni Lemel to the wedding on that horse, that poor horse, my God. We, yeah, that, that horse was, was, they chose him. I mean, it was typecasting. They looked for a horse that was about to drop dead and <laughs> poor horse. But uh, I learned from watching my, my father uh, and my mother. He was my hero, and he had what's called chen. He had chen. It's something you can't learn. You can't go to school for that. It's just something that you're born with, this charm that he had. And I, just, I used to watch him uh, from backstage, and I just tried to be uh, like him. And I guess we, we become our parents at some point, don't we? Uh, we do. There's a question. First of all, thank you. That's very kind. Uh, why not remake it in the United States? Um, I think it should, yes. I, uh, by the way, this is a restored digital print. What they've done, Adam, it, it's amazing, isn't it, what it looks like? I mean, this, this was 50 years ago, and uh, the, in Israel, the Cinematheque went to the trouble of doing a, what they, what they can do today is amazing with t today's technology. If you saw th the scene where both Kuni Lemels meet at the door, um, do you, Adam, you remember what we had to go through with that? There was no uh, uh, split screen at that time. There was no green screen. There was no uh, DGI. Uh, I remember how it was done. Uh, Adam. We had the camera, and in those days, you had to find a straight line where the, 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 um, the frame would be split. And so, uh, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, Adam. We, we, uh, um, we had to, they had to, first of all, um, close up one side of the gate, one side of the, of the frame. They blocked it and they shot me on one side as Kuni Lemo. The problem was that I couldn't, because of sound in those days, I didn't hear 
what the other guy was going to say, the, the questions and the answers. So I had to, um, I had to um, time the question and the answers, imagining the timing of what the other side would say. So we filmed that side first, and then they rolled the film back, right? They rolled the film all the way back to zero in the canister. They then closed the other side of the frame, right, Adam? And then they shot me on the other side, responding to what I had done before, and I had to sync the answers that this guy was giving to what I remembered I had done on the other side. It is, it, I, I don't know how we did these things. The scenes in the, in the forest, that song is a very famous song, Omrim Kiani Eneniani, everybody remembers that song. Uh, that, was, uh, that was also um, done, today it's amazing what they can do, but it was all um, lip synced. I had to, there was one, we were out in the forest, and there was one speaker, a huge speaker that they had. We had pre-recorded the song with the Israel Philharmonic, and I barely could hear what I was supposed to lip sync to, and it's, I don't know, it's it, what we accomplished in, you know, with those uh, conditions, Adam, was amazing. It really was amazing compared to, you know, how easy it is today. <laughs> Any other questions? <laughs> how, long did how long did it take to make the movie? That's a good question. Adam? You don't remember? 50 years, you don't. <laughs> uh, I think we, uh, we sh and it was in winter, by the way. It was winter time, and I think it, it was at least about a month, if not more, more than a month. And one interesting episode, Monty, that I will never forget, the first day that we shot the film, our makeup guy was a guy named Uri Gross, and they had to make sure that my eye was, my eyelid was shut. So he used a um, liquid on my eye that um, when it dried, it, it kind of squished, you know, the eyelid, and, and it remained closed like this. And so we shot the first day, and that night, I mean, in those days, we didn't have the, the luxury of just doing films. We had to do a show at night. Everybody had to go back at night and perform. We were touring with the Megillah at that time. So we finished the shoot at about 6 o'clock. I came to the dressing room, and I said, Uri, okay, can you remove the makeup, please? And he said, uh, I'm busy now, but just go home and wash with soap and water. And, and that's it. Okay, so I went home and I washed with soap and water, and the eye was closed. <laughs> and I washed some more with soap and water, and the eyelid stayed locked like this. And I had to go and do the show. So I did the, the play that night with a shut eye. And pe really, I, my eye was shut like this. You know? yeah. Fortunately, you explained the part of Borsha Diane. <laughs> well, anyway, I came back the next morning, and Uri was standing there and laughing. I said, what, what did you do? You said it comes off with soap and water. He said, well, I'm sorry. The only way it comes off is with acetone, like nail polish, you know? I said, I, he said, I just wanted to, you know, give you a little, you know, the first day a little joke. I said, did, you didn't know that I was going to perform on stage that, that night? I said, I, I performed like Moshe Dayan, you're right. Yeah. Anyway, that's uh, that, that, some of those, uh, you know. And um, the most important uh, event that happened was the day before the last shoot, that big wedding scene that you saw, uh, they brought, if you see um, the flying matchmaker, that was the uh, Mechabe Esh. The, the uh, fire department, the only way we could do that, remember, Adam, they brought a, this big winch, 
or whatever it was, and the fire department, uh, they, they attached a uh, harness to poor Klotchkin, you know, and they re actually flew him up there in the air. But the problem was that the night before this big final uh, uh, scene, our uh, producer, Mordechai Navon, dropped dead. Remember, Adam, the night before, the last day we knew this was, we had to finish the wedding scene. And I got a call and we came to the studio. He had had a, uh, um, a stroke and uh, he died. And we didn't know whether there was enough money uh, to finish the last day. Nobody knew. But luckily, um, he uh, had left enough instructions and uh, he was a visionary. This was his, um, he wanted to immortalize uh, the life, uh, the, the Jewish life of the shtetl uh, before the war. He had left enough money and uh, the movie is uh, dedicated to his memory. But it, it, we all, remember, we, we almost didn't know whether we were gonna finish the film. If he hadn't prepared it, there would have been no film. How do you deal watching yourself on the screen? Well, no, but he's watching himself from 50 years. By the way, I did see you. I was in Israel. Well, I'll tell you a little story, a little anecdote. You know that my wife was one of the producers of a woman called Golda with Ingrid Bergman. Remember that film? Golda. Uh, when, we, when I was in Israel, we, my wife arranged to have a screening of For Whom the Bell Tolls starring Gary Cooper and Ingrid Bergman, so that Ingrid could see herself as she was 50 years before, just like he did. We were sitting in Cinematheque in Jerusalem, watching a film, I was sitting next to Ingrid Bergman. And the film was on for about 20 minutes, and there on the screen was this young 19-year-old Swedish beauty, and here was this very sick woman, because Ingrid was, Ingrid was sick while she was making the picture. She died shortly thereafter, and she saw herself on the screen and after 15 minutes, she turned and she said, I cannot stand to watch this, it hurts me. She got up and she left. The question is, how do I feel seeing myself on the screen? Well, Batya just said, I look the same. <laughs> no, not quite, not quite. Uh, you know, it's a strange feeling to see yourself uh, on the screen. All I can say is that uh, I'm, the big, I'm, I'm my biggest fan. I love to see myself. On <laughs> I enjoy it. I really do. I, I think it's, I, it's, I think it's a, you know, it's a great film. And, and that poor cat, I really identify with Kuni Lemel. I feel sorry for him. He's such a sweetheart. There's a lady in the back. I know that lady. Hi, sweetheart. Yeah, I know it's a sphere. 